Our next guest is Roy Ennis, who is the national chairman of the Congress of Racial Equality. Before I say a few words about this eminent individual, I'd like to introduce some of his co-sponsoring organizations. We have with us Marita Noon, which you stand, as well as Ron Arnold. Marita is with the Citizens Alliance for Responsible Energy, and Ron Arnold is with the Center for the Defense of Free Enterprise. These individuals are collaborating with Chairman Ennis on the distribution of his new book, which you should have received when you registered, called Energy Keepers, Energy Killers. Roy Ennis means a lot to me for a number of reasons, because 35 years ago, during the formative period in my life when I was about five years old or so, um, I was going to college at the time and uh, <laughs> child prodigy, but what happened was I was down in Atlanta, and when I was down in Atlanta, I fell into a group of erstwhile black militants. At the time, we called ourselves Pan-Africanists. We were the young brothers that were going to save the world and save Africa at the same time. And so Dr. King had been dead several years. And so on the national stage, there were several black leaders. You had Floyd McKissick. Then he went off and founded his own little black city that he called Soul City. And in the aftermath, Roy Ennis emerged. And I can remember Roy Ennis on the stage being interviewed, like they used to interview Malcolm X. And uh, he spoke eloquently. But the thing that impressed my little group down in Atlanta was he was a big booster of Africa and things African. He was over in Uganda back in the 70s doing this type of work. And so we admired that. And we wanted to emulate the programs that CORE was attempting to do. We have CORE officials with us today. Would the people from CORE please stand up so people can see the respect and the uh, support that we have here for Roy Ennis? I mentioned today that what's happening is we are merging the human rights and the civil rights movement into the global warming movement. And this is essential because what's happening is politics is not enough for us to get out of the problem that we're confronting. I don't know if you know it or not, but on the Republican side and both the major candidates on the Democrat side, all of them have the energy and environmental issue wrong. All of them have global warming wrong. And so if you're depending on someone to go in the White House and stop this holocaust of global warming, regulations, carbon taxes, and things of this nature, I'm sorry to tell you that you're going to have to rely instead on the thing that Dr. King relied on, which is movement. You're going to have to rely on media. You're going to have to rely on touching people with film, touching people with print media, getting people involved going into the streets, doing the civil rights thing and the human rights thing, because that is the only way that we're going to move the ball to keep freedom in America. Let me give you an example what we're up against. According, here you got senators, three senators running for president. The Congressional Budget Office said that a cap and trade system aimed at reducing emissions by just 15 percent will cost the poorest 3%, the poorest quintile, the poorest one-fifth of Americans, 15%, will cost 3% of their annual household income while benefiting the richest 20% of Americans. Raising energy costs also loses jobs. According to a Penn State study, replacing two-thirds of U.S. coal-based energy with higher-priced energy will cost almost 3 million jobs. But yet you'll see the candidates go around saying that they're going to create green jobs and they're going to invest in biofuel. Do you realize that the price of corn has gone through the roof because of the fact that they have dedicated a policy of energy policy to say they're going to make 35 billion gallons of ethanol. They're subsidizing it rather than importing it from Brazil which is cheaper because of the tariffs they have, bad economic policy that they support. But what does it do? It's actually increasing the cost of food. Right now, food prices are going up in America because of the craze on ethanol, and these same politicians are waiting in the wings to keep providing you that type of leadership. We need Roy Ennis at this time. This is a time when we need movement. This is a time when we need more than just scholars and more than just engineers 
throwing stuff against the wall to see what will stick. I submit to you that the impacts of the civil rights and the human rights of Americans is at risk, and that Roy Ennis at this point is an apostle of moral consciousness. The human and civil rights icon is a successor to Martin Luther King Jr. as an advocate for empowerment of minorities and women, and Roy Ennis is also a champion for social, political, and economic justice. He's certainly a 21st century drum major for justice. Here in the shadows of the human rights efforts initiated by Malcolm X at the UN in the 1960s, going all the way to the mountains of Uganda, Roy Ennis is Harlem, Roy Ennis is New York, Roy Ennis is America. Join me in welcoming the civil rights icon of the global warming movement. colleagues on the dais were very disciplined and precise and short with their remarks. So I will try to do the same. Although I have a book, I wouldn't punish you like that. <laughs> uh, copies of my statement was passed out, uh, Brian? Yeah. So I can, I, I'll, I'll skip around somewhere. I'll leave some things out and you can follow greater details. The great American civil rights revolution of the 1950s and 60s was one of the greatest and most successful social and political liberation of the people in the history of mankind. Now, this is a very challenging statement. It happens to be true. No time in history can we show an example that, is, that occurred with less violence in a quicker time and lasted like the American Civil Rights Revolution of the, of the 50s and 60s. The French Revolution didn't last very, very, very long before it became a tyranny and with a lot of bloodshed. The Soviet re 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 Revolution, the Bolshevik, revolution in Russia, well, lasted most of the 20th century, but that went down based on the good work of Reagan and Bush. And support for the rest of us against the prescriptions being, being given by the liberal establishment and the media. African Americans achieved this liberation in America when our country was at the height of its military power and, ec and economic power. Now, it's very interesting to, to, to recognize that the Bolsheviks took over Russia when they were beaten by the Germans in the First World War. And the same thing was true in the French Revolution. The French government had bankrupt itself trying to help us here, the America and the colonies, beat the British. And that's when the revolution took place. But the American Civil Rights Revolution of the 50s and 60s was just the opposite. America had just come out of the Second World War as the number one power in the world. And number one power militarily, number one power economically. And yet we were able to pull off this great liberation of our people in the midst of all that power. Now to do that, we either had to have some black nuclear bombs or hydrogen bombs or something more powerful, and we did. We had a weapon of moral consciousness working for us, along with a tenacious hold on the moral high ground. And what, what do I mean? I mean that we were very disciplined in holding on to a moral appeal, being moral ourselves on one hand, 
and making the appeal to people who have the potential to be moral to the American people. Now, I'm not going to stand here and tell you that I had believed it was possible. I did not believe for one moment as a young Turk that this was possible. There are those like Dr. King that used to use the examples of Gandhi and the British. And I thought that there may be something in the, among the British they are more sophisticated, more polished. But I couldn't see the cowboys in America <laughs> responding to a moral appeal. But they did. They did in a very short time. No time in the history of mankind has that ever happened. And what happened after that was very, very interesting. And that, that the 64, 65 Civil Rights Bill, uh, no one really knew exactly the effects of it. Uh, but you, you saw a constant accommodating to that new reality in the part of the American people. And before the end of the century, the political civil rights were achieved. And we saw the clear sign of that when, uh, when got, uh, Wilder, who became Governor Wilder of Virginia, when he won the governorship of Virginia, the queen state of the Confederacy, Virginia of massive, massive resistance and all that. The Virginia of Robert Lee and, and Stonewall Jackson, they elected the grandson of a slave to be governor. Virginia with an 18% black population. And as uh, Doug Waller told me, once, once I uh, said that in front of him, he said the voting population in Virginia was not 18% black, it was 13%. That means that a whole lot of white folks voted for Doug Waller. But that suggests something I must say to you, that that great victory of Doug Waller, that the great victory of America, of Virginia, was relatively ignored. Why? Because it was not a blowout. It was a very narrowly won election. And the media establishment interpreted that as something was wrong with his victory. Now, he won the governorship, <laughs> uncontested. No Florida, no chips and uh, <laughs> tags and all those things. No Supreme Court. But the media interpret that as something racist because he did not win by a larger margin. And that suggests a problem that we have as we look to further struggles. How do you interpret success? Socially, we have achieved our civil rights. Segregation has been ruled unconstitutional. In fact, more than that, which politician, in what part of the country goes around running and campaigning as a racist? Old George Wallace used to say he lost his first election for judge in Alabama to somebody who out him. And he swore, never again in my life would I let anybody out me. And he didn't. <laughs> George Wallace rode to the very top, become governor of Alabama, ran for the presidency until he was struck down by a wacko. But George Wallace was one of the last of the types that used to campaign against minorities, openly, actively, uh, palpably, in every way possible. That doesn't happen anymore. Because the moral victory of the, 50, the 50s and 60s was so powerful, the passage of the Civil Rights Bill of 1964 and 65, public accommodation and voting rights was so powerful, and the basis, the weapon used, was so strong 
that it changed the American people. Now, this must suggest that there was something special about the American people, because nowhere else in the world can we find a similar example. Uh, the, the struggle of the Indians against the British Empire took much longer and uh, over a longer period of time. And a, and a different circumstance where you have millions, hundreds of millions of Indians and one small British army, an army that was decimated in World War II uh, after having been decimated in World War I. So it's a different ball game as to the American situation where America came out of World War II as the number one economic and political, economic and military power uh, in, in, in the world. They had a moral consciousness that we worked on as a, as a movement and we won. Now, I say to you, we have to think of this weapon. This weapon was studied by the environmentalists, and they too are trying to use this moral weapon. The difference, of course, is that they cannot lay claim to the moral high ground. Not when, as happened today out in Washington state, several houses, did you all hear of this? Several houses were burned down because they weren't green enough. That's not holding on tenaciously to the moral high ground. But they have been successful in getting a lot of legislation dealing, in fact, they're the ones who guide and drive uh, energy policy and environmental policy. And here you have a situation where it is their voice that defines and intimidates and guide the legislatures and the presidents. It's not an accident that all three remaining candidates for the presidency of the United States, we are gonna get a, a, a president in 09 that is committed to this green lunacy. There'll be no debate among them except to how, much, how green the program can be. Uh, and that came about because of the decency, the desire, and the part of the American people to do the right thing. In other words, they were able, because of media, relative media monopoly of, of, of uh, the print and the airways, they were able, and in using the techniques, using the weapon, without the morality, but use the moral guilt, the desire on the part of the American people to do the right thing. It's a very important statement. The American people are good people. They want to do the right thing. And what we did in the civil rights movement was to sensitize and hypersensitize the American people to do the right thing. So when the environmentalists came along, many of them coming out of the civil rights movement, I know many of them from the old days. They came out of the, the, the civil rights movement and move on to the earth movement and the anti-nuclear movement and all of these new environmentalist type movements. And knowing that the American people were super sensitized by us in the civil rights movement, they proceeded to appeal to them morally to the extent that all they have to do is to mention their program, call it saving the earth, the environment, and all of the catchwords, and people just lay down and accept it. Politicians do not debate these questions, they go along. That's why we have a shortage of energy. That's why we have to spend billions, $400 billion a year buying energy from our enemies. 
for them to bring, the in, to bring our money back to us in terms of terrorism and other difficulties. That's why our economy is in such bad shape. All of that can change very quickly if we start using the energy that we have here in America. We are one of the first ones in, in, in the area of coal, energy. We have a lot of oil. We have more uh, oil than the government wants to admit to us. You know, Anwar could supply us all the oil we need, along with oil off of the Florida coast. That one is particularly stupid. I mean, how can we restrict ourselves of the Florida coast when Castro is drilling for oil in the same place, along with the Chinese? I mean, but it's possible if you cloak it in the moral dressing of the environment, the earth. We have to wake our people up to let them know that they are paying a heavy tax, a heavier tax than anybody else. We have to help our people to understand, don't allow the environmentalists and their friends in the media to select enemies for us, for them, on us. Our problem is not Exxon. Frankly, I don't care how much money the chairman of Exxon makes if he can supply oil for me from Anwar, from the Florida coast, from other parts of Alaska and other parts of the United States, if we can change the regulations to free up the use of coal energy, of which we have an abundance, more than any, on a per capita basis, more than any country in the world. Yeah. If we can drill for gas, if we can use what we have, that will increase the availability of energy and the normal laws of economics says that the price of energy will drop. Energy, the price of energy, when we are facing today, we have gone past the $103 per barrel. Debate is going on, except the president doesn't know about it, about the question of $4 a gallon of oil, uh, gas. That's, that's almost criminal ignorance and the part of our leaders and in part of us, the citizens. So what we have to do is to make a commitment to go into struggle around this question of energy, recognizing that it's a civil rights to have available and affordable energy, recognizing that it is implied in the Bill of Rights and, and, and the uh, Declaration of Independence, our right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. How can you pursue those prescriptions if you do not have sufficient energy to use to enjoy those things? But we have to first educate the well-meaning, good American people as to the game that is being played against them, the trick that is being played. And yes, we recognize they want to do the right thing. We have to help to point out where they are being suckered. None of these candidates, we, we have the first woman candidate in a, in a serious attempt to gain the presidency. We have the first serious black attempt to contest for the presidency. Yet neither of them understand the things we are talking about here this weekend. And the question is, can we go to them and educate them? No, we can't. Because we don't have the reinforcement from the media. We don't have the reinforcement from the years of monolithic propagandizing that went before us. So we have to go to the people. We will, I'll talk with McCain. Uh, I don't know whether Hillary would talk to me. 
I don't know, Barack is prepared to, to hear, he wants change, he says. But I don't think he wants this kind of change. <laughs> McCain, and he's, he's a little bit ahead in terms of energy in that at least he recognizes that nuclear energy is a legitimate pursuit. He uses the example of his carriers that have been running around the world in the, in the, in the oceans using nuclear energy without any, any, any difficulty. But the real solution is to go to the people. We have to get hold of the airways. We have to demand equal time. We have to put it in the, in the shape of, of civil rights. Political civil rights, we have that. We've done a good job on that one. Social civil rights, we've done a good job. We have done a very bad job on economic civil rights. And this is the way in to reach our people and change the debate around the energy question. Letting the people know that they are being robbed. Promises of no new taxes has no meaning if you have more gasoline prices, more heating oil prices, more gas prices. Inability to use coal energy that denial, that shortening of, restricting, constricting of the available domestic, domestic energy. Right? There, there's concern about the money we spend in Iraq. I'm more concerned with the money we spend given to foreign energy sources. That 400 million, 400 billion dollars that we spend for energy with foreign sources could be spent better finding, making available energy domestically in America. Our energy, something that all of us are entitled to as Americans. But we have to let people know that they are being robbed, that they are being taxed, that they're being And that is the move to put the polar bear on the endangered species list. Now that seems like a very innocent phenomena, but it's not at all innocent, you know. The endangered species list is what made it possible to outlaw DDT. And by outlawing, outlawing DDT, we created a situation and just to deal with sub-Sahara Africa and alone, not even the world, where a hundred, one million children, million kids in sub-Sahara Africa die every year from malaria infection. I was with Anne in Uganda recently doing this documentary and we went to Malago, the, the, the hospital in Kampala. And I'm talking to this young doctor and her, the mother of her, uh, the, the, of a patient of hers. And the mother is there with her child. You probably remember this, and the child is in the coma, dying from too many uh, relapses because of malaria. Malaria, uh, DDT, is illegal to be used in Uganda because the Europeans would not buy Uganda products if they didn't find any trace of DDT in the product. Now, mind you, in case you don't know, in World War II, we used to spray German soldiers with DDT to delouse them. And hold on to your hat. We used to spray American soldiers too, <laughs> for the same reason. No one died from being sprayed with DDT. Now, I'm not suggesting that we have DDT for supper. <laughs> but using it for spray 
It's what made it possible for us to control malaria in the United States. It's what made it possible for us to control malaria in developed nations in Western Europe. And after they have rid themselves of the, the malaria mosquitoes, then they outlawed the use of malaria and leave Africa and other parts of the world, the third world in particular, to suffer the ravages of that. But this was particularly interesting with this lady. I gave that same little story to her in front of her, a doctor, a child's doctor. And she, she said, but uh, you can't use malaria. I said, why? I mean, uh, DDT. He said, well, why? Well, it's not good for the environment. Let me, try, let me try it again. Her child is in a coma right there, two feet, three feet away from us. And she is concerned with the earth. It's been around for a billion of years, taking care of itself. But she is concerned with the earth and the environment. And I said to her, well, who told you that? Well, I heard it in the radio. I heard it in the television. I saw it in the newspaper. Now, this is a nice little lady, a very concerned lady. Her child is dying. But the propaganda has been so ingrained in her that she's unable to be rational in terms of priorities. What is the priority of this lady? The earth has been around for billions of years, or her child, who is a four, four or five years old, in a coma. And that's what we're up against. The same thing is here domestically. You find our people, good people, wanting to do the right thing, going along with the Kool-Aid drinking around climate change and the environment and the green earth. We can reach them. But to reach them, we all have to develop. Ralph said the right thing. We have to have a movement. It has to have the passion and the moral high ground that we must hold on to. And we must know that there is a moral conscience in the part of the American people. And if we can hold on to the moral high ground and then reach out to the American people, we can win this battle. But we have some big enemies. The environmentalists have a head start on us. They are well organized. In fact, what burns me more than anything else is that many of the people that they rail against, like the big industrial companies, are the ones who cowardly caves in and give them contributions, funding their hostility against the rest of us. There are no broke environmentalist organizations. They are well healed. And I, I wonder why we have stood idly by and let this happen. Recently, Senator Olympia Snow from New England and Senator Rockefeller III sent a letter to Exxon Mobil. Actually, think of this. Think of this fascistic behavior. Actually threatening. Did you folks see that letter? It was in the Wall Street Journal. You know, Ralph, we have to get that letter and have it sent out to people. Threatening ExxonMobil that they should not support people who they, they consider and call Earl, world ca ca catastrophe deniers. You know, those of us who are willing to question the policies and the laws that restrict our acquisition of reasonable, affordable, efficient energy, we are deniers, you know. They, they, slick 
in a very slick way, have pushed us into a, a, a corner to look as if we're like the moral equivalent or the immoral equivalent of the Nazis, the Holocaust deniers. All right. We have to challenge that. We have to expose that fascistic behavior on the part of Rockefeller III and Olympia Snow. And they are not innocent in that, in, in that action. And my suspicion is that it chilled ExxonMobil. I don't know who else received a letter like that. And if any of us have any knowledge, any information about other corporations that were equally threatened. I guess it's easy. Once you threaten ExxonMobil, the biggest boy, and the, the thousand pound gorilla, yeah, it, 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 it works to intimidate a whole lot of other people. And the, the sick part is that Rockefeller and Snow are being intimidated by the environmentalist wackos. And he would not, they, would, they would not make a connection between what happened last night in, in, in Seattle, Washington, and the, the environment of the suburbs of Seattle, Washington, where people took terroristic, raw, and naked action. We're not just accusing them wildly. They left a note. They were proud of their activities. They alleged to be, in their mind, and in their minds only, they held the moral high ground on that issue. Now, we know it's not true. They did not hold the, high, the moral high ground. You know. uh, they perverted morality, but they have reached through media monopoly. They have reached ordinary people so that with all the primaries and voting and the money raised, ordinary decent Americans who want to do the right thing are not going to understand the game that is being played against them to deny them energy. So I'm calling on all of you gathered here today and every caring, thoughtful citizen in our great nation to join with me in challenging the energy killers, these modern day Bull Connors and George Wallaces. Now for you, you young ones, these are great metaphors. <laughs> <laughs> I was almost as young as, as Ralph. <laughs> he, he was five years old. I was six and a half. <laughs> but let me, let me assure you, some of the, the metaphors we use in this, in this statement are brilliant, frankly. <laughs> and I couldn't resist them. <laughs> Who are standing in the, the doorway trying to prevent poor Americans from achieving Martin Luther King's dream of equal opportunity and true environmental justice. We must tenaciously hold on to the moral high ground as we appeal to the moral conscience of the American people. They are good people. Remember, the American people are good people. They want to do the right thing. Together, we can make this thing happen. Let us start by protesting, putting the polar bear on the endangered species list. But let me tell you, if that happens, the bureaucrats and the politicians and the environmentalists, wackos, are going to be able to monitor and sue us to death and intimidate our legislatures, local and federal, and there'll be no end to how much they will control our lives. We can do it together. We can do, truly make change, not Baraka change, real change. Thank you.